Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a bit surprised to be in such a huge hall, and you've all spread out to make it look like it's uh, even fuller than it is. Um, I've been at uh, Kent County Council for four years. Um, as Andy was just talking to me, they didn't have a head of procurement, which is quite ridiculous before I joined, so I've been in there sorting them out, and we're, we're sorted now. Most of my background, however, is in the private sector. I come from the dark side. Um, I'm, construction is my background. Goodness knows why I'm talking about social value, but that, what I want to do is talk about it. I don't want to um, give you a lecture. Um, I want to have some interaction, so I'm going to come up there if you don't start talking to me and pick on you, um, because it's really important that we, we make this interesting and social value is something that I think there's a lot of confusion about and I think you can almost make it what you want it to be so and because I work for a county council with politicians and uh, my when I joined the council um, I met with the leader of the council and I said right what would you like me to do and he said give all the work to firms in Kent <laughs> okay would you like me to do anything else? No, give all the work to the firms in Kent. And I said, well, actually, I'm going to do two more things for you. I'm going to give you value for money, and I'm going to manage risk, because they're the two things that uh, councils are really bad at. And I never worked for a university, so I, I don't know what you're good and what you're bad at. But, uh, and I ended up doing this because Don, who's the um, head of procurement for Kent University, dropped me an email and said, could you do a talk on social value? So I thought, well, okay, I can do if you want me to, uh, but it's got to be interactive because you probably know more than I do. So the whole knowledge of this in this room will actually make the talk worthwhile. So what we're going to do is, um, what is social value, first of all? What do the procurement rules say about social value? And we've got quite a lot of differing opinions on that, so that will be quite interesting to see what you think. So if you want to argue with me, I do like an argument. I am a builder. I like a fight. No, sorry, no. Uh, and occasionally, occasionally I forget I'm in the public sector and I do slip in, I will nearly slip in a swear word, but I stop myself. We'll be all right. We'll be all right. You'll keep me going. Um, Incorporating social value into tenders, really important. It's a tricky old thing to deal with. How do we do it? Um, and finally, the actual main question, is social value value for money? And I'm really interested in uh, the university's opinions on that. So, what is social value? I'm also the fastest talker in the world, and I like the sound of my own voice. So, we'll probably finish this in 10 minutes if you don't join in. Um, this is one of these rubbish uh, quotes. A process whereby organisations meet their needs for goods and services um, whilst generating benefits to society and the economy. Um, and I think that's okay, it's a bit wordy, but it's about those extra benefits. And in a county council, as I say, I can understand why we want to do that, because if we have extra benefits in our county council, it stops um, the need to provide services. We have no money. We're, Andy was saying we spend 550 million on social care. It's, um, we have, we've got more older people all the time. If we can get people to look after the older people, all the children, all the people with learning difficulties, um, then that's great, because then we don't have to spend the money. And then, so I'm not so sure that social care, uh, social value is, uh, is altruistic, shall we say. I think sometimes it's about actually um, saving money for the council. So here are some things that I think are examples of social value. So we've got creating skills, training opportunities, creating employment opportunities for needs, um, offering work placements in school children and adults, providing care adv uh, career advice, offering curriculum support, providing additional opportunities for individuals facing groups, um, greater supply chain opportunities for SMEs, creating opportunities to develop the third sector organisations, improving market diversity and encouraging community engagement. 
Can you think of any more, sir? <coughs> I'm going to pick on people unless you talk to me. You can, you can, it could be used as a promotional tool as well. Promotional? What do we mean by that? Well, if you're a supplier or um, such, you could incorporate that into your marketing to your customers. I'm going to give you a good example of that on the next slide. Well done, sir. Thank you. Madam, have you got anything you can add to that? I'm coming now to get you oh, all. Gosh, yeah, I'm taking the wrong seat. Um. It doesn't matter where you sit, it's him I'm getting next. <laughs> graduate employment or intern or graduate, you know. You see now, universities, that's what I would have years, thought you'd have been years, saying. Gap years, you know, student internships. internships, that's the word. Paid internships. Pa of course, a highly paid internship. <laughs> <laughs> not highly paid. <laughs> nope, not too Something. Okay. That's a pretty yeah. So here's some examples, and um, this, the top one, I think, is about this promotion. So it, these are real examples, and I'm sure you're going to give me some more in a minute to so start thinking about them. Um, bank delivering training on financial management in schools as part of winning a council's banking contract. So actually, that's the bank being really lovely. No, dark side. It's the bank actually hooking those young children into um, knowing that bank's name. So when they go and open their first bank account, they think about that bank. Because they were really nice and they gave us sweets when they came round and told us about how to look after our money. That's where the dark side think. That's the, what it's all about. You have to be careful. Um, construction frameworks guaranteeing apprenticeships. There's several of those about. Um, construction firms need apprenticeship, apprentices and if they can sell it and make it sound as if they're actually giving you something they wanted to do anyway, they're, they're, that's great, fantastic. The last one's one of our recent ones in Kent. Uh, it's a, um, a third sector organisation, um, Young Lives Foundation, and this is actually genuine social value, I think. So they've employed two care leavers, um, increase volunteering and increase local fundraising and that's really what we should be going for because they're not from the dark side they can be our partners we can work with them um, and I think that's a really good example um, we're going to talk about how we get to these in a in a moment when we talk about the tendering process so anybody else got any really good examples for me because I was scrabbling to find them you know People are ducking now. Look at him, he looks like a man that's got an example for me. You've covered basically all of them. <laughs> oh, there's loads more. No? Anybody? Charity work. Charity work, which is sort of that bottom one, because you know, they're, they're a charity, um, but they've actually then carried out local fundraising, saving the county money, thank you very much. So it's... Um, it's, and also employing care leavers, that's one of our biggest issues. Um, children that have been in care, getting them employment is difficult for us. Well, it's social enterprises that are providing any services like um, uh, daycare or, um, or uh, holiday schemes for disabled children or whatever, there's, there's a the social enterprise. And off offering your, like when you're buying your furniture and things like that, you can put it on, you can give it to other people, can't you? Is that social value? When you buy, when so you, when you're replacing, recycling, recycling. Yes. Yes. yes, free cycling. Yes. <sighs> See, I told you I'd learn something today. <coughs> free cycling. Yeah, I've, I'm a builder. Giving Come on, stuff away, giving stuff away. But just specific, worthy yeah. causes. Is this the brains trust just here? Come on, the rest of you better need to compete with this. Oh, sir. You're a builder. So you see you're a builder. What about when builders have to build playgrounds and stuff if they're allowed to develop housing estates and stuff like that? That's social value, isn't it? No, that's, that's, yes, the bribery is a good word. Or, or 106 agreements where we, we make them give us something. In, they will get, won't give you anything for, for nothing unless... You can negotiate. We'll talk about that in a moment. That's good. That's, if, that's really what, if you think it's worthwhile, because you are actually going to pay for it if you put it in your ITT. Pay for anything you put in your ITT. Indeed. So... Is social value value for money? That's what we're going to talk about. Yes, sir. 
Are you, are you smiling? Are you going to tell me something? But things like, um, oh, things like thank you, madam. student hardship funds, so helping students maybe from disadvantaged backgrounds, they're struggling, does that, does that count? That's, that super counts, yes, but I don't know how you do it. We've got it, we negotiated it into one of our contracts, so they actually, the supplier will contribute to a student hardship fund that then helps, you know, particular students. And do you think you're paying for that, though? So might you as well have you just given the money to the student anyway? Not, or am I just a cynic? So. Not necessarily, no, not in that particular case, but I think yes, that can happen. They just factor it into the margin. God, we're whizzing through this far too quick. <laughs> Sponsorship. Sponsorship. That's, that's another bribery, isn't it? Sponsorship. <laughs> what sort of sponsorships? I don't know, just, you know, um, uh, contributing to the community programmes and things with schools. And when you talked about internships, what, so is this working in the organisations themselves or...? Yeah, it's all, all like mentoring. Because actually that's almost a win-win, I think, because um, organisations want clever people from universities to go and work with them, so if you, they get a year out with them as part of winning a tender, I don't think that's... I think that's a really good one. Universities are measured on their graduate employability. And it's very attractive to a graduate to for an undergraduate to go and actually say they've had a year's work experience at some big company. So has anybody done that in any of their their tenders? Said, will you employ graduates? Because I think actually that's probably a possible zero cost thing. So there we are. We've had that's a good one. We like that. Thank you. You like it? Oh, I good. do. It's I get good. a bonus point, do I? You do. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. I think we could do a lot more than we do. Yeah. Of well, it doesn't sound like we do it at all. Well, I, I, I wonder why, why we aren't doing it more. Well, you know, take we this away. Write it down. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Right. The rules. I hate public sector. Um, <laughs> right. The Social Value Act came out in 2012, meant nothing. Um, the authority must consider. The word consider doesn't make you do anything. Um, how what is proposed to be procured might improve the economic, social, environmental well-being of the relevant area. Andy was talking about this earlier, saying, what's the relevant area for a university? I know what my relevant area is. It's Kent County, not Medway. I think one of the young ladies was talking about being from Medway. There you are, you see. We don't like Medway. <laughs> <laughs> um, ooh, careful. Um, so, relevant area. What do you think is the relevant area for a university? Well, this is the tricky problem, isn't it? It's because there are some towns and cities that, that are one HEI paying higher education institution town. So maybe that town is the relevant area, maybe, and the and the catchment area around that. But you know, even Canterbury is a two university town, isn't it? It is. Um, is it? My apologies. And people don't go to their local university, so actually yeah. the catchment's got to be wide. Yeah. And and you know. I, my consortium covers London, which has 40 plus higher education institutions in it. So, what's their relevant area? Mm. And they, you know, obviously, students come from all over the world to all our universities. Mm. What's their relevant? Is, is it the entire planet? Possibly. Mm. Does, does the area have to be geographic? Could it be the area yeah. in terms of? stakeholder well I think it entirely could be because yeah. yours That's could be define it yeah people the in higher education the, yeah. The state, yeah staff the, do they care about the staff right. yeah, okay. the <laughs> <laughs> but again it's a bit airy fairy and it doesn't really mean anything anyway <laughs> how in conducting the process of procurement it might be with a view to securing improvement so that applies over the OU threshold you just check, because I could be wrong. You still Have you got the same OU threshold as us? 172? Oh, yes. Good. That's all right, then. Because uh, central government's only 111, isn't it, or something? I'm just checking. I don't want to... I know nothing about universities, as I say. I don't know a lot about a lot, really. Um, but, da -da, in um, February 2015, we had the new 
public contracts regulations, which sort of encourages again more, but still we're going back to that um, consider. We still don't have to. Um, Crown Commercial Services would probably tell you you do, and all their guidance will say you should do, um, but they tell us a lot of things. Am I making it really tricky for you with them cameras running around all over the place? Great. Um, <laughs> Uh, contracted authorities shall base the award of public contracts on the most economically advantageous tender assessed from the point of view of contra the contracting authority. In the old rules, it was quite difficult to actually bring social care in, and we believed that um, you were actually going against the old rules if you, if you use social value in evaluation. Um, because they didn't give you the option that comes later. That tender shall be identified on the basis of price, cost, using cost-effectiveness approach, such as life cycle costing. Um, da, 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 da. But then it says social aspects linked to the subject matter of the public contract in question. Now, it needs to be relevant as well, which is quite important. So if you go into social value and it's not relevant to actually what you're doing, then I think you, again, could be straying into difficult territory. And I don't know how it is in university land, but in the public sector, I, I used to work in the public sector. I did, worked at Waltham Forest, London Borough of Waltham Forest, and that was before the Remedies Act came in. I then went back to the private sector. Um, then the private sector was all crashing, so I came back to the public sector, I'm so honest, I know. Um, and the Remedies Act had come in, and they all started talking to me about challenges. And I said, what are you talking about? And then bang, bang, I kept getting hit by these people who wanted to challenge me. So it's really important that you understand what the risk is of challenge and uh, what you can do and what you can't do. There's more on this, he says. There we go. Such mock criteria may comprise, for example, quality including technical merit, um, Social and environmental. We haven't mentioned environmental. That's another key thing that's in social value. So environmental aspects, if you can actually do something, well, I was going to say without polluting, but something that improves the environment, that's a social value as well. And the next bit we're going to come on to is how we actually do a tender involving social value and this is key because it says advanced disclosure make the evaluation criteria known to the bidders at the first opportunity including sub criteria and evaluation methodology <sighs> i've read these rules a lot because i'm also the local government association NAG, National Advisory Group for Procurement, South East Representative. So we did a lot of consultation with Crown Commercial Services while they were bringing all these regs in. Lots of consultation, completely ignored. But, um, and they, they've brought in a load of things that are actually quite difficult. Social value is all right, so we can live with that. But uh, um, I think we're in a place where there's going to be lots of challenges moving forward because there's no case law. So we need to be careful and we need to be aware of what we're doing. So, great. I'll talk you through this. This is a flow chart from, uh, from my organisation. There's two prongs on this flow chart. There's actually three, it should be three really. Three ways you can incorporate um, social value into a tender. One, and the simplest way, is you write it into the specification. So you actually know what you want, you just write it in the specification and say, you must provide me six apprentices. You must, what was the gentleman, build me a playground as part of this building a school for free. Um, so that's really easy, that's one way you can do it. The other way, or the other two ways, is the, f the first box says your requirement. This is what you're going to do, what you're trying to achieve. Consider your options. And then we've got two ways, evaluating social value or just inviting people to submit proposals. I've written loads of tenders as, in, as procurement in the private sector. We get involved in putting tenders together, working with our estimators and the tender team. And 
they're not as clever as you think they are in the private sector. So if you hint that you want apprentices, you want them to do training, you want them to um, give you ideas of social value, then they will give it and they will write it in their tender because they think it's going to help them win. It doesn't actually help them at all, but once they've written in their tender, it's in their offer. So it's in the offer, so you can now contract on that, and they have to provide it because they've said they would. But you haven't actually used it in evaluation, you haven't told them they've got to do it. And I think, I'm just going to see if I can read it. Uh, we've got, sorry, it's not up there, I thought it was. We've got a standard thing that says, what social value can you provide as part of this contract? We just stick it in every tender. And if they offer us something for, for free, then we just take it, because we're not going to evaluate on it, um, and we just say thank you very much. That's very kind. We'll have those ten apprentices you said you'd give us. Um, it's an easy route. Second route is actually evaluating on social value. Now we're getting into difficult territory, because if you remember, and I'm going to go back to that, Advanced disclosure. Make the evaluation criteria known to the bidders at the first opportunity, including sub-criteria in evaluation methodology. Now what that means is, you've got to tell them how you're going to measure. So you've got to tell them what you want. You can't say, oh, give me some social value, because that's not going to be good enough. That's not going to help. You're not going to be able to evaluate that and make that clear. You might be able to do and get away with it, but you're taking a risk if you do. What you should be doing is say, we want you to give us, and I keep saying apprentices because it's the easiest thing for me to say, three apprentices, oh no, apprentices. The more you give us, the more points we'll give you. And you know, one apprentice equals two points, three apprentices equals six points, and so on. And that's where this comes down to evaluation criteria, including sub-criteria and evaluation methodology. And I don't know how many you have been challenged, but evaluation methodology, if you have model answers, if you have model answers that you give to your people to who are going to do the evaluation, you need to give them to the suppliers. You need to give any guidance you're giving to your people that are doing the evaluation to the suppliers, which is bonkers, totally bonkers. Incredibly, when you do that, the suppliers still don't get the right answer. But it is bonkers. But that's what case law has told us we've got to do. So if you're doing social value, you've got to be really, really clever and really know what you want. Has anybody used social value in evaluation like that? I'm not surprised. It's really difficult. Sorry? It's too tricky. It is tricky. It's real thin ice, aren't you? But all of my clients are going, we need this. You don't have to work with social workers, do you? No. You can imagine I'll get on really great with them. They're really touchy-feely. <laughs> Everybody's our friend. <laughs> oh, don't be nasty to them, Henry. <laughs> so, so they want social value, so I have to develop ways to give it to them. And... Uh, this is our route down the left-hand side, which says um, define requirements, clearly define with your specification the aspects of social value that will need to be delivered by the successful bidder. So we're actually telling them what we want them to do. And if you don't do that, and then you don't tell them how you're going to evaluate it, you're taking a risk. You're doing it against the rules. I'm not saying you shouldn't take risks, because you should, but you need to decide how big those risks are. And it depends what area you're working in. Um, some areas, like one of the biggest areas for challenge I found, is catering. Catering co ca companies love challenging tenders. I don't know why it is, but they do. Construction actually are quite useless at, ten at um, challenging, so they're okay usually. But uh, you can't. Uh, IT they love a challenge, but. And you might say, well, actually, social value in IT, can we do anything? But actually, we've just come up with one, haven't we? You know, IT companies are great for sending graduates to, I would think. So if you want to get that in there, you could do it in your specification. You could do it by saying, what social value you can give me? Or you can say, we will give you points for every graduate you take for a year. We're going to 
give 5% of the total quality score will be based on how many graduates you will take in the year. So you can do it if you really clear what you want and you know how to measure it. Anybody want to ask any questions about that? But does that discriminate against the smaller supplier? <sighs> discrimination against smaller suppliers. Well, why? Well, because if you've got a big supplier, you can say, oh, I'll take six apprentices. Well, a smaller supplier can't afford to take six apprentices. Well, I'm sorry. So the poor SME or, you know, little local man can't well, do it. When you write your tender, and this is in, in anything I do, so you, you remember my target is everything needs to go people in Kent. Well, 55% of our business goes to people in Kent. And the reason it does, well, two reasons. One, geographically, if you noticed, Kent's surrounded by water, so actually it's, it's sensible that it does. But also, um, we, we actually go out there and really design the tenders. So in the new rules, you're now allowed to put it into lots and say you can only win one lot or two lots or whatever you like. In the old rules, you couldn't. But we did it anyway because we thought the risk was actually minimal of being challenged. So we broke things down. Sometimes it's right to be built, break them down. Sometimes big is best. You need to decide that. You need to understand the market and do it in the right way. For me, I mean, my job, my real job, is making sure we've got enough money to pay for old people and children and all of that. And if we don't spend the money in the right way, then we won't do it. And importantly, um, big doesn't always mean the best, it doesn't always mean the cheapest, it doesn't always mean that you're going to get the best service. So don't always think that. But sometimes, if you're buying pencils, probably best to buy big. If you're getting some local service and you know you want to encourage SMEs or voluntary sector organisations to do it, break it down. So, evaluation. It must be fair and transparent. Everything we do, fair and transparent. It's great in the private sector, I tell you. <laughs> None of that nonsense. Um, if you intend to use social value and evaluation criteria to avoid risk of challenge, you must clearly set out what you're going to evaluate. I've said all this, haven't I? God, I'm brilliant. Um, for each apprentice you employ, you will be awarded a point of evaluation. If you're prepared to risk challenge, it will probably be a small risk. You could be more general. So we have done tenders where we've said, we're going to evaluate on social value. What can you give us? Where we actually are evaluating as well to go with our lovely social work friends. Um, and we haven't been challenged, but if we had have been, we'd have lost. So you need to be aware of that. And when you do a tender, any tender, everything you do, it's about risk. I want to do something, I want to achieve this, this goal. Um, what's the best way to do it? I want to do it this way. Mm, don't really quite comply with the rules. What's the risk of challenge? If you do get challenged, it's a pain in the neck and you're going to roll it all back. But are you going to get challenged? You need to weigh that up before you do it and decide. And well, actually, we're just, we're not deciders. We suggest to the client, this is the risk. If I was you, I'd do it, but it's up to you, client. Has anybody here been challenged? I don't know whether it's just me or... No? Nobody's been challenged on the tender. Lots of threats. Threats, Andy. Lots of those. When we default, there would be a challenge. Yeah, it depends what you mean by challenge. Do you mean formal challenge? Formal challenge, yeah, but I mean... Proceedings issue. Yeah. Have you had proceedings issue? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we no, no, that's not true. We haven't had them for two years, because we're now better. <laughs> but when I went in there for thinking, oh, life's changed, doesn't it? Remedies Act. Oh, dear. Do you, do you know one of the other changes in the, the new rules is you need to publish um, how many suppliers you pay within 30 days and how many suppliers were entitled to interest payments and how many suppliers you've actually paid interest payments to for late payment which to me I just can't get my head around it because that's bonkers that's saying to suppliers that look oh Kent 
They didn't pay many people on time. They didn't pay any interest. Hold on, that could have been us. Let's go and claim interest off them. It's just encouraging. It's just not a commercial private sector view, but I had a debate with um, the lady that runs the uh, NAG group and she was talking about retention on construction contracts. Am I wandering off the point? I've got plenty of time. Um, on construction contracts, um, we, we get a retention. You know, you, 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 you hold back 5% until the job's built and then you give it them back. Well, she, we were saying, oh, a lot of people don't ask for it back. They forget. So I said, great. They went, oh no, we must tell them. And you see, that's the difference between the private sector and the public sector. I don't think even in the public, why should we tell them? If they haven't bothered, if they're rubbish, then they shouldn't, well, it's their fault. So anyway, well, all those 5% are good. Pay for some more old people. Yeah. Ethics, well, it's, it's not unethical, I don't think. <laughs> I see, this is my issue. I don't know, maybe I am. <laughs> Gracious. I, I totally agree with you. I, I don't think hanging on to that 5% is unethical. But I do think you should aim to pay all your suppliers on time. Too right. In Kent, we, we pay in 20 days for no benefit, which is a bit bonkers. But that's what politicians want us to do. So 30 days we contract that, but we attempt to pay everybody in 20 days. So you shouldn't worry if somebody looks down your list because you're a good your person they want to deal with. So well, appropriate. and that's actually one that's of the benefits good. of the public sector. We don't go bust and we do pay our suppliers, so, but we really are wandering <laughs> off now. <laughs> I've copied this, and I'm sure it's illegal to do it, so don't anybody tell them. This is off the social value portal, and this is about trying to measure social value, and I just thought this was a really complicated example and can be an issue. This is where you could get to if you, um, if you want to actually measure social value properly, and actually, is it worth it? I don't know. So in this example, um, they're actually putting savings, money savings, to um, in getting people back into work. And I think they, I'm trying to find the bit, there was a bit about getting offenders, young offenders into training, and they've actually said that's worth £5,000, and we got this many, so that's... So they're actually putting cash against it. And this is, this is a website that is um, free to go and look at, but don't tell them I showed you their slide. But for me, it's a bit too much. It's a bit over the top because I don't know how your contracts are. And in, in the county council, we tend to let a contract and then hand it over to the service to manage, <sighs> um, which, doesn't really happen very well. So if they can't manage the delivery of the service, the payment of the contractor, the making sure they do the KPIs, goodness knows how they're going to do all of this. Anybody else have issues? Do you have issues with contract management in universities? Or do you do it yourselves? No. no. Yeah. Oh. The man there frowned. Do you do contract management in your university? <coughs> Yeah, well, I work for a consortium, but most oh. institutions, I think, manage their own contracts that they put in themselves. Yeah, but not the procurement teams, all the procurement teams. Yeah, Mixture. Yeah, but a bit, bit of both. Yeah. yeah. So, for me, I mean, I don't manage social work contracts. Um, I don't um, manage construction contracts. We hand them, we, we'd let them and then hand them over. My team's only relatively small, so... Sometimes I think we should do all the management, but actually then well, there wouldn't be a council, would there? Because we're all moving to be in a commissioning council. Do you, do you, a commissioning authority, are you doing that? Do you do that in universities? They don't know what it means, but that's what we're, we're doing. <laughs> so, value for money, what do you want? So, for me, and I've said our key aims are supporting Kent business, Apprenticeships, encouraging the third sector, in improving educational attainment. All of those things are key things that we want to achieve and we need to achieve via um, social value or via tendering. And I don't know whether you all get the same issue. I had my team meeting this morning and we had uh, a debate. We had a, 
One of my t team has, has been talking to the, oh, let's get this right, arts and culture team. And basically, an art, the arts and culture team think that we should incorporate arts and culture into every single one of our tenders. And then obviously business continuity think we should incorporate business continuity into every one of our tenders. And um, we then had health and safety, who actually we've got sorted out and we work really well with. So, we, and we do incorporate that into all of our tenders, but in a, a more minimalistic way than the tender becomes, oh, information governance, governance. Oh, that's the worst one. That's just really coming on board. So the tender would be this thick if we're not careful. So we need to actually make sure that we get everything we need, but it's slim and usable. Because suppliers, if we make things complicated, will not price. They will either not price, times are getting a bit busier now, so they're less keen on us. When things were hard, they were quite keen, but now they're less keen. So it's really important that we actually um, make sure our tenders are, are appropriate. And uh, all of these people that want their little bit in there, um, but they want it to be huge. So the arts and cultural people have convinced the director of waste that it's really important we get arts and culture into our waste contracts. You know, running your municipal tip gets art and culture in there. Goodness me, I don't know. I can just sit down. Um, so, I think we've started to talk about universities and what you want out of that. So, we've talked about graduates and we've got the brilliant idea that we're all going to put, you know, employ 50 graduates every time we let a contract or year out students. Chris is one of my graduate trainees, who used to be, when I was at Waltham Forest. That's why he's on the front row. He's a good, good man. Not like you lot at the back. <laughs> uh, so, have we got any more university stuff? Because that's what we should be talking about. And have we got any things that you think are troubling you? Because I've, I've given you a bit of an overview that you think, yeah, have we got a, I want to do this, but I don't know how to do it. You've all come to talk about social value at four o'clock, which I was stunned about. I expected to be in a small room with just me and Chris having a beer. Um, so you've all turned up. So it's obviously something that's troubling you, and I'm a bit confused why social value is troubling universities. Something's driving you, obviously. I'll tell you what's troubling. I'm from a consortium. Right. And what's troubling me on it is the fact everybody talks about wanting to do it because it's good, but most universities are only interested in saving cash. And how do you, there's a huge disconnect between social value and what you're buying. The, when you do environmental stuff and sustainability, you can put that into the economic model because you save energy, carbon, and it's quite easy to put it into a financial model. But social value is incredibly difficult to get the financial bit into social value and what is it? And how do we measure the benefit? And I don't know who your bosses are in uni. What, would you have a chairman of the university or something? Who, who, who's vice-chancellor? Vice vice-chancellor. And so you have a vice-chancellor. So do they care about, do they say procurement? Some do and some don't. Some have it in they, their corporate they mission statement. They say that they care, but, they don't. you know, a lot of, no disrespect, I'm a university procurement, so I don't mean this disrespectfully, a lot of university procurement teams, they lack basic procurement skills and approaches that the private sector have been doing for years, let alone more advanced and legally challengeable stuff like adding in social value and, and, and how to evaluate that. So, you know, our challenge is, this to me, you know, if we want to go back to the Vice-Chancellor, you say, oh yeah, that sounds great, but implementing it is extremely difficult. Well, I think we've come up with some good ideas. We can, you can tell him, and we're going to get 10 graduate placements in the next year from tenders we're going to let, can't you? That would be good. Would he not like that? He would like it. Oh. It's just almost like low down on the list of priorities. You know, and it doesn't factor as part of what we define as value for money. And I don't think a lot of people understand or agree what value for money is. So, but if you can actually deliver the same amount of good or service for the best possible price, 
and you can get some graduates in because I think that's a real win-win or you can deliver something else because the tenderer thinks you know by asking that question what's social value we, it's in every one of our tenders and we get loads of stuff we hadn't thought of what's social and then we don't care well we do care what it is but if they've offered it then you can contract on it it's in their offer but it's not actually something that we're going to evaluate on so you can do that in every tender and question yes andy have you, if, um, so you, what you, the way you phrased it, which is very interesting, the way you phrased it actually is, to, is this is aligning procurement strategy with the strategy of your employing organisation, right? Because when, when you That's what we do, to, I hope. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> because when, when you spoke to the leader of the council, he, he or she? He, he, he sorry, very he. Said, uh, I, want, I want to support Kent business, and presumably he wants all those other things as well. What I and of course getting those, getting those things for a county council is has has social value. I suppose the question we need to be asking ourselves is: is getting things that the university aims to achieve is that social value in the way that the legislation is written? Can that be counted as social value? So Back to your relevant. Want, right? What do universities want? Growth, they want research income. They, you know, they will want, what else do they want? Help me. Student numbers. Student, student numbers. numbers. You want the student experience to be higher. So you want to do well on league tables. You want lots of citations for references of your academic, so your academic prowess. All of those aims that the university has, if we can, if that, if achieving those aims can be counted as social value, then maybe we're on something. I hadn't thought of it that way before. But, and I think that's the important thing, and that's why I've written, because I didn't really know. Where's Don gone? I'm going to slap him. But if, I had no idea what, what your aims were, but that's the key. You need to be aligned to them to actually, and then you develop your strategy to deliver what they want. And you can get some of it for free. I know I've been a bit um, careful with my words, but if you actually put it in the spec, you will get it priced. Um, if you write it in such a way that you're going to use it in evaluation, then you can really drive, but I'm not sure that you want to be doing that if you're, um, if you're not up for challenge. Uh, we've got hundreds of lawyers at Kent as well. But surely the way to get social value in your contract without paying is to get a win-win. If, if you've got a scheme that's a win for you and a win for your employer, for, for your supplier, you will not pay for it. You could get better value from it. And how are we going to find out what that is? That's the difficult bit, or perhaps... Well, isn't the that part bit? of our category management and our initial understanding yeah. the marketing, talking to the suppliers, talking to our stakeholders, and actually mapping stuff out the early, at the early stages talking, to kind of isn't think it? What, and what, what's doable. The, the very first time I came into... I used to work for a civil engineering contractor, and I thought that um, procurement was so rubbish in the public sector that I ought to come in, because obviously... It would be easy to... save you. <laughs> no, well, I don't know about that, but you know, if you go somewhere rubbish, and if you make it mediocre, then you're, you are, you know, you've you you done really well. People think you're great, but all you've done is mediocre. Um, so that was the problem. People were not... And when I went into the public sector, people didn't want to talk to suppliers. They felt that they were risking a challenge. Well, actually, suppliers are desperate to talk to you. They're desperate to tell you, this is the way you should tend to this. And actually, if you talk to them about social value, um, one of the things they'll do is and, and say, explain what it is. We're trying to do this. You can talk about your graduates. You can talk about anything. There he is. Trouble. It's his fault I'm here. Uh, <laughs> Um, why is he wearing a pink shirt like that? Is that a Kent shirt? Uh, conference one. Oh, conference one. Do I get one of them? No. That's nice one. pink. Very yeah, it's very pink. fetching, I thought that. <laughs> Go well in the construction industry. Um, sorry. Yeah, so if you engage, and we at Kent we do lots of market, market engagement, and uh, we're, we're I, I, you don't know, but we're currently, we have to do public health. It's a new area we've taken on. So the first thing you do is you get 
you advertise and you say, you stick a pin out, I love pins, and say, we're thinking about doing this, come and talk to us and get as many people as possible to come and talk to you about what's possible. Because suppliers want to do that, they want to give you, they want you to tender in a way that gives them the chance to give you the best price. If you just do it on your own, then you won't get the best way. And actually, I think this social value and all you consortiums that are here, you actually got a, a potential there for, for getting suppliers in and saying, this is what social value is. These are our aims in universities. How can you deliver that as part of the tender and not cost us any money? And what, what is a win-win situation? And if anybody wants to be your partner, don't use that word ever with me. <laughs> because when they say we want to be your partner, that's when they've got their hand inside your wallet and they're just taking the money out. Be careful. Were you going to say something, sir? Agree. You were agreeing, good. Yes, sir. Sorry, my name is Marius. Um, I'm from South Africa. Are you? So, um, just to hear me, you've come all... Oh, fantastic. I <laughs> oh. just want to share with you that uh, in South Africa, there's a drive for social development and social responsibility. Um, sounds to me like there's more of a drive there than what you actually um, experience here. And there are some examples that I could share, but it's not really applicable to your environment. So from from the university sites, they're actually driving social value and social responsibility as well. Well, have you got an example? Surely we can get one of them. Well, you've mentioned some of them. Um, apprenticeships um, certainly is one of them. Yeah. We can break it down further in, in South Africa where it's not necessarily people who are educated. Um, it will go basically down to grassroots levels as well. So, in, um, so when we let contracts, we, you know, we let construction contracts and things like that and all sorts of apprenticeships are a bit different to what I think they used to be like, but you know, window cleaning apprenticeships, not sure about that. Um, but so how do you actually get that into your tenders? How do you get that You've across? You mentioned it, um, we actually bring it into the evaluation process. So you evaluate, but you don't have the... It up front as well. yeah. So do you have something like the EU rules that we have to wear, or uh, uh, procurement rules in South Africa? No, basically it's, it's a new concept for us as well. Right. Um, and that's why I actually attended your, uh, your presentation as well. Uh, but we started implementing it. So South Africa's ahead of us. Come on. <laughs> Come on, universities. <laughs> this is no good. I've never met a nice South African, except for Maurice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Spitting image, no, before your time, isn't it? Oh dear, oh, I'm so old. <laughs> uh, I'm going to wind up soon, and we're going to be 10 minutes, and Chris can take me to the bar. Um, is there any more questions? Anything else we need to talk about? Social value. I, you know, we've done lots at Kent. Lots of. I also believe you learn from mistakes. So if you don't do anything, you don't make any mistakes, and actually you're not doing your job so you should be doing something I expect people to make mistakes and when we get challenged we don't get challenged again in the same way and when we do social value we're gradually building up a, a knowledge base of, of how we can do it so and that I thought I might learn something today <sighs> disappointed <laughs> Henry, can I just get clarification then are we deciding the uh, benefits for universities in commercial deals count as a social value? I think so. That's something we can say. I, I, I think it's true. Yeah, and, and certainly I think we've had some good ideas today from the Brains Trust. Would it, um, would it, would it fit with the, the legal definition? The relevant bit. In the act? Well, I don't think it's necessarily benefits to the university, it's benefits to the community. Does it not? Yes, whatever well, that community is. Benefits, benefits to a county council yeah. counters benefits to the community because they're yes. almost interchangeable, right? What we yeah. said, and if we if we argue that universities generate social benefit of some kind, mm -hmm. yeah. And don't forget, it's about also not being selfish, shall we say? So some of the things that we do will actually not help Kent County Council. So if we take somebody off. 
uh, somebody gets a job, it's actually central government that are saving the money because they're no longer having to pay them, pay them unemployment benefit. But actually, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Because Kent aren't benefiting from it. We might get some... You are. You've got more money in your local economy. Yes. Yeah. But it's also helping central... And I think maybe we need to take that more global view that uh, it may not necessarily help you or your organisation 100%, but actually... It's Do you think British people are more selfish than perhaps? Because when you're trying to get alumni to donate, the, it's not something they want to do. Whereas the Americans, they all donate to their past universities and there's mm. big funds there. Mm. And we're not like that, are we? David we're Cameron's big society. We, we want to look after ourselves. I think people aren't donating to universities now through alumni, I think because they see universities as businesses. Think people mm. do. But Whereas the US people, are all businesses. Well, British all people private. give to charities, I would say. The third sector. I think that's where British people are generous. I think different, when is the crisis? Yeah. different cultures are different. I actually came back from Japan on Saturday, uh, Sunday, and Japan is the nicest place I've ever been to. They all care about everybody else and it's all together. Nobody drives big flash cars. Um, Thatcher never went there. Um, <laughs> stop it now. Uh, and it's a Tory council. <laughs> I work for a very Tory council. <laughs> So, I mean, you're right, there's different cultural attitudes, but actually we can work still within that nasty dark side, it's all about making a profit, but still, I think we can still do some stuff, and if you can be the, the leaders in that, you can perhaps change the whole culture of the country. I'm counting on it from the Brains Trust. <laughs> okay, I'm going to finish with seven minutes to go, if anyone, unless anybody wants to say anything. Good. Uh, it, it, do you want to take more questions? Uh, I'd love more questions. I'll stay here all night if you like. Got seven <laughs> My wife hates me. No, no, sorry. <laughs> Anybody who has a question? Yeah, have you ever been? Have you ever been challenged on social value? Not on social value. We haven't. Um, and. I think because most of the tenders that we've, we've done it on, where we've actually evaluated using social, it's been very much voluntary sector organisations and they're not into challenging at all. So we can ask that very general question. The gen when we ask the question on bigger tenders that we put in every tender, there's no challenge to have there because we're not actually evaluating, so they can't challenge us. Just added on. But do yeah. you get much, so you do feel just putting a general uh, word in your, your tender to say, please let us know what social value you can provide us, does actually re it, return It returns rewards because people think suppliers are stupid, don't think they're all really clever because they can be really stupid. Um, I used to be a supplier, bear that in mind. And they will give you stuff because they think, they, oh look, they want social value, let's give them this, this will help us win the tender. It's not actually going to help them at all, but it may give them that, you know, thinks that they're going to do it. So, yes, you will get stuff. Apprentices is really, they usually throw them in. If your if you're free offering as a supplier is not taken into consideration when you do your evaluation, but your offer is slightly worse economically, but massively better socially, would you then sort of ignore that and say, well, we're not going to go for the social option, even though it's better for us, but slightly worse economically? You can't. You can't, you can't because you've not put it as evaluation criteria. You ignore it in your so therefore, you'd, you'd ignore the social responsibility element. Only, yes, you would if you haven't. If you just put the general question in, so it needs to be the best value tender, the most economically advantageous tender, and you get some social value thrown in. For nothing. If you really, really, really want social value, you need to evaluate or you need to um, put it in the specification. Well, I think it goes back to what, what your think tank said <laughs> <laughs> engaging with suppliers. Because I was, I was speaking to a supplier earlier at the exhibition who said, Actually, we wish the buyers would speak to us about how we can yeah. improve the environment because we've got this particular thing that produces waste by 20%. So you're not improving the university's position, but the environmental and you know, scenario is much better whole, holistically. And that's really important. And then the other thing we haven't really talked about, oh, I was finishing then, Andy, look what you've done. Um, 
The only th you need to decide how important social value is to you, because if you are doing an evaluation criteria, is it 1%, 5%, 50%? And I think if you make it a small percentage, you'll get stuff, but actually it won't necessarily sway what you're doing, but people will give you stuff because they can see you're going to evaluate on it. I think for investors that haven't done or incorporated, it is a bit of a risk to put it in your evaluation criteria, but there is no risk in putting it in that general... No, and criteria. I will... And we'll learn that way, won't we? By, by doing that, we'll see what comes out and what is offered. And I'll, I'll, I'll put it under added value, so it'll all be not just by itself, but with other things. So what added value, it might be 5% or something. Well, I'm not, yeah, not, don't, don't, even, don't even put a percentage on it just put what can you get we've got a standard clause or standard words I'll send it to somebody and they can share it with you who shall I send it to Andy Susan Coop team yeah. right Me yes. right I've got a business card yeah yeah okay I've got I've got the coop thing because I'm here today aren't I so, yeah, they must have emailed me <laughs> okay anything more gentlemen he's fallen asleep now come on did you want to go? I know you want to say something. Well, just where things have been in Scotland is there's a kind of big push on living wage. Oh, so yeah. That's been kind of cost me an extra to the tender, but is that something that's been done here? Living wage, anybody putting that in their tenders? Somebody told me that, um, that you, you might get challenged if you insist that suppliers mm. pay the living wage, which is a, a warning which I have chosen to ignore. I don't understand how you could get challenged, because it's open, fair and transparent. If you say you must pay living wage, then you, that's fair to everybody, isn't it? Uh, well, I don't know. Mm. Some lawyers told me that. Oh, I hate lawyers. <laughs> they, well, and another lawyer said it was fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, living wage, we have, um, as I say, we've got domiciliary care, £140 million a year, home care, that is, you know, all on minimum wage. Massive effect for us if we go living wage. The living wage, it's a bit of a, if you actually calculate it, it's not as big as they're making it out to be. It's not the proper living wage it's a it's a step towards it and actually the, the rate they're bringing it in isn't massive but for us it's still 15 million on our residential care we think so it's a it's a big issue for us and we haven't got 15 million so goodness knows what we're going to do don't get old all right but you'll see it again because that will put more money in the pockets of workers in the county who will spend money on goods and services and boost the economy and you'll get it all back in. Like We're in the Keynes building, aren't we? Indeed. Yeah, see? Keynesian economics there from <laughs> Mr. Davis. But, yeah, is that, yeah. But we still have to shell out the 15 million and, less, and, and they've still given us less money. Tory councils don't buy into that fear as much. Well, yeah, well, so, some, some with, it, with us, yes, Adam Smith. Okay, any more done. questions? Is there, are we all done? In which case, um, thank you very much, Henry, for, uh, for a most stimulating, <laughs> intellectually stimulating, <laughs> and engaging and revealing uh, discussion, um, uh, uh, it, it, which means that you can now tell your leader of the council that you've given a lecture on this at the University of Kent. Yeah. Social value there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so thank you very much for that. That's, that's really uh, filled in some gaps in my knowledge and, and made me rethink some of it actually completely as well. Lots so thank you very much for that. Good. Can we thank Henry, please, everybody?